So this is to do with the Newdigate family. They're a Warwickshire <coughs> family. And I first encountered them in the letters of physician Sir Hans Sloan. In 1706, Elizabeth Newdigate wrote to Sloan complaining of weakened health after her siblings had turned against her because she was in love with an unsuitable man. From the outset, I was intrigued. Why was he unsuitable? Was she melodramatic? Little did I know that this was, in some ways, the least interesting part of the family story that I would eventually uncover. Turns out that the Newdigates had a multitude of family problems, culminating with the son's attempt to have their father declared insane in 1701, and the children's emancipation from their father in 1702. But the Newdigates haven't made it easy for the historian. The otherwise detailed family diaries and account books are largely silent and sometimes deliberately conceal the real problem. Although the family records and medical letters provide teasing hints about the real problem, about the family scandal, the most extensive and obviously most one-sided account is a pamphlet published by this fellow here, the father, Sir Richard Newdigate, in 1707. Now, with such scanty evidence, there's a methodological problem. I can't put together one clear interpretation of what happened, and the evidence is in places much more dependent on speculation than certainty. Sometimes the father appears as a sympathetic victim of his greedy and demanding children. At other times, the children appear as victims of a controlling father. So what I'm going to do today is tell you two different versions of the story, and perhaps you can help me tease out at the end what, what, what we think it might be. Um, so one will be from the perspective of the father, the other story will be from the perspective of the children. Now, despite the lack of one clear narrative, I think looking at the story side by side is helpful because common themes emerge. The instability of patriarchy, as especially as a man aged, the importance of family strategy, even in the midst of dysfunction, and the use of illness to punctuate moments of transition in each narrative. Although medical historians have tended to focus on individual case histories, I'm interested in what reconstructing entire families' medical case histories might reveal. And so this is one of my test cases today. It's only by looking at the Newdigate's health collectively that the significance of illness within the family structure emerges. Bouts of illness pointed to the family's underlying problems and exacerbated existing tensions. So here is the first page of the case laid out by Sir Richard Newdigate. So I'll start with his published account, which he put out in 1707, two years before his death. And I'm just going to outline the basic timeline of events, um, which also happen to give insight into, at, the, at this point in time, 63-year-old Newdigate's understanding of the family troubles. His goal in writing the account was to defend his tarnished reputation. For several years, Sir Richard had, had been embroiled in legal difficulties with his 10 living children. Those most implicated in the troubles, especially around 1701-1702, were the two eldest sons, Dick, aged 30, 33, and Jack, aged 29, as well as the second youngest daughter, Elizabeth, who was aged 19 at the time of the troubles. As for the three who remained blameless, or at least um, according to Sir Richard, these were daughters, two who were married and one who was mentally ill. When the trouble started in 1701, Sir Richard was in fine health. He'd just undertaken a lengthy tour of France and the United Provinces, along with Dick and Elizabeth, in 1699. After only a few months away, Sir Richard found that his second son, Jack, who had been the estate manager in his absence, had been living a life of debauchery and neglecting his duties. Worse yet, Jack had had his younger brother Frank, who was aged 15 in 1699, committed as a lunatic. When Newdigate called him to account, Jack, quote, fell into a fever of the spirits. Now, tensions had emerged with Dick the eldest even before the French trip. 
Dick married in 1694, but with, when his wife died within the year, he was unable to maintain his own household and he moved back home. So it's really hard to know what exactly triggered the son's actions of 1701. But by May of 1701, while Sir Richard lay delirious with a fever, Jake and, Jake and, De Jake and Dick, Jake. <laughs> anyways, Jack and Dick <laughs> moved to have him committed. Allegedly, um, they also attempted to kill their father by poisoning, and, and perhaps the worst of all to Sir Richard was organized a humiliating attack by ruffians. And within weeks, a London jury declared Sir Richard a lunatic. Now, it was a long process for Sir Richard to regain control, and even as he made progress, another case came against him before the House of Lords in February of 1702. The four of his daughters who still lived at home accused him of, quote, cruel severities and unreasonable usage and practices, and that's taken dire directly from the House of Lords papers. After a month of intense negotiations, the daughters withdrew their petition and agreed to settle privately. The family-wide agreement gave financial settlements to the seven unmarried children and sent all four of the daughters to live with their uncle, Sir Walter Baggett. In July, the House of Lords overturned Sir Richard's committal as lunatic as well. Now, relations unsurprisingly remained tense. Jack repented, but Dick failed to keep any of his promises and even apparently was failing to collect the rents. The situation worsened in 1705, shortly after Sir Richard and Dick um, both took new wives, and then Jack died from smallpox. And Phyllis, the eldest daughter, had officially been acting as Sir Richard's housekeeper from 1695 until 1702, even though she'd been suffering from repeated bouts of ill health and, and it seems, mental problems from 1697. Now, in 1705, um, Sir Richard was obviously no longer her guardian, but he was con concerned when Dick had M. Phyllis committed as a lunatic. So, in other words, Dick seemed pretty much the bad guy. Dick, moreover, was evicting tenants for failure to pay rents. He demanded that his father take a new mortgage. Sir Richard granted Dick 2,500 pounds per annum in 1706, and as he put it in his account book, to the end he may not have the temptation to wish or contrive his father's death. He also proposed a new settlement for the entire family. The goal, as Sir Richard saw it, was to divide the land, spread out their debts, and ensure that the noble estate be preserved to the family. Sir Richard appeared to be feeling his age now. He was growing bitter, and he was also suffering gout. In a will dated 1707, which he later cancelled, he also disinherited his children in favour of his new young wife. And Sir Richard's health steadily deteriorated until his death in 1709. It's a pretty sad story, isn't it? And I think it leaves the reader with a lot of sympathy. But then the pamphlet was a public defence in which Sir Richard was explicitly crafting an image of himself as a sick old gentleman to reinforce his innocence. Now throughout the pamphlet, Newdigate used the language of pain and he drew on common anxieties about aging as well as the you know, ideal of a patriarch who is continually protecting the family. He was a suffering, loving father. And he also highlighted repeatedly his vulnerability as an aging man. Now in reading Newdigate's narrative, I use approaches of history from histories of law, embodiment, emotions, old age, and masculinity. Thomas Lecour, for example, has argued that there was a growing humanitarian impulse in the 18th century, while Natalie Zeman Davis has examined the process of constructing sympathetic narrative strategies in the courtroom. And this pamphlet, I think, needs to be read within that context of how people tried to persuade others of their innocent, innocence. The pamphlet, more to the point, also uses the language and stories of pain, illness, and fear. And illness was crucial to the narrative structure. Newdigate's descriptions of illness and suffering also had dual physical and emotional meanings that highlighted all of those anxieties about the aging. 
For example, the fear of being abandoned by one's family, which as some scholars have suggested could be a reality for elderly, early modern men. Recent psychological studies on pain overlap theory also suggest that social exclusion results in physical pain, and this was something that early modern people knew very well. So work on early modern aging has outlined various other fears, in particular <coughs> decline of mind and body and the loss of independence, and these are themes that keep coming up throughout the pamphlet. These could all be especially troubling for a man used to being household head. So I think we can, we can see Sir Richard's account as being very carefully crafted using evocative language and familiar motifs that would exploit his, his audience's fears and sympathies. So just to go into a bit more detail, um, Sir Richard, for example, depicted himself as a good father, an efficient estate manager, and a loyal citizen. He packs a lot into this. It's only 15 pages long, but it's, it's very rich. And he actually sets up his character foils, his sons Dick and Jack, as we've seen. The Newdigate family troubles were really quite well known in London. As Sir Richard put it, they were infamous as to be the byword of all taverns and coffee houses about town. So he really did have a concern about preserving his, his reputation. So he created the image of a good father. To do this, he drew attention to his affection for and his financial care of his children. He repeatedly emphasized the size of his family, that 10 out of 15 had survived to adulthood, and he wanted more than anything to treat them all equitably when he divided the estate. And he also emphasized that he'd fulfilled his, his obligations to them as a parent throughout their lives. He'd spared no expenses in their medical care, clothing, education, and travel. And as just one example that he gave, when Dick asked to move back home after he was widowed, Sir Richard welcomed him back unreservedly and even refused any money from his son. From the first page, Sir Richard portrayed himself as a forgiving patriarch who continued to protect his family. Despite the dishonor brought upon him, he wanted to protect his children from any disrepute. So, for example, although he described his favorite son, Jack, has grown very debauched, um, you know, he sees both of the sons as undermining the family rather than him, that they're the ones bringing the family into disrepute. Dick he saw as being even worse. Dick he didn't even see as acting as an independent man. Rather, Dick, he claimed, was persuaded by his father-in-law and priests and Jesuits, and for um, people um, in the 17th and 18th century, this was completely ridiculous that, you know, to be, to be it's anathema, really, to be likened to a Catholic um, if you're a Protestant family. And, you know, the whole idea of committing Sir Richard had really come from the priests and Jesuits and father-in-law according to Sir Richard. Sir Richard, moreover, believed that both sons colluded against him by bribing witnesses to accuse him of what he called horrid crimes, as well as attempting to poison him. And these were sneaky actions, unbecoming to independent men. Sir Richard's goal was to preserve the estate and the family, even if those very children betrayed him. So he goes on to describe in detail the value of the estate, the taxes, the expenditures, and the debt. Again, all this in 15 pages. Newdigate detailed the amounts he had settled on each of the children, as well as any major expenditures. Now this served two purposes. First of all, it highlighted his allegations that Dick was greedy. Second, I think he was attempting to show that he still had the mental acuity to run his own estate. He might be getting old, but he still had his wits about him. This contracted with the neglect of the estate by both Jack and Dick. So Sir Richard wanted to preserve the family. Dick was trying to break it apart. Sir Richard also depicted himself as a loyal citizen. And this was, I think, an attempt to establish his credibility as a witness. Several of the estate's expenditures, he pointed out, had been used for defense um, during the civil wars. 
and he'd also had substantial loans that he'd made to Charles II. He also mentioned at one point that he'd helped to dig up the armory of a local trader and turned it over to the government. It's worth pointing out here that um, Sir Richard Newdigate had played a, a key role during the Civil War and was quite loyal to the crown. So he's really playing on his former reputation here. But again, his sons, he compared to those popish traitors. And in fact, they couldn't help but pick it up because in Warwickshire, there'd been a number of traitors and enemies to the state who had abounded there. And they follow, followed the popish maxim, cast dirt enough and some of it will stick. Now, Sir Richard, of course, depicted himself as this upright man and good father accused of terrible crimes by enemies. And this contrasted with his reprobate sons. Now, the pamphlet can also be read as, oops, as an illness narrative. In this case, an autobiography punctuated by meaningful bouts of illness and the language of pain to reveal the physical and emotional toll. Throughout the 15 pages, there are six references to illnesses, and each functions as a transitional point in the narrative. The first illness was that of both Dick and Betty, which had forced them to return home early from their trip to France with their father. The sickness marked the end of the family's unity and was a moment of absolute geographical separation between the father and the children. All of the children were back in England while he remained on the continent. The second and third illnesses came in rapid succession when he arrived home. He had trusted Jack to manage the estate, but arrived home to discover that Jack had been running it down and, of course, had locked Frank up. In fact, he, he even accused Jack of driving Frank stark mad. When Sir Richard confronted his son about these problems, Jack, of course, took ill. So Frank's mental illness and Jack's fevered spirits highlighted the family breakdown in progress. But the main illness account was Sir Richard's own, comprising two pages in the middle of the pamphlet. He had been about to confront Jack about the irregularities in the estate accounts, but then himself took ill with a fever and delirium. It's at that point that Jack and Dick acted quickly to have their father committed as a lunatic. Newdigate, while ill, even had to protect himself. And again, there's a, a narrative um, tendency, I think, within the family, thinking back to the letter from Elizabeth Newdigate, because he describes himself as standing at the window with a sword in his hand for five hours, trying to persuade all passers-by to please help him. His illness was cured inadvertently by the poisoning attempt by the, the sons. He'd received a hamper from his estates and he was about to drink from an open bottle when his footman cautioned him, suspecting the drink to be poisoned, as indeed it was. The poison led to violent vomiting and diarrhea, so a really good purge, and by the blessing of God, he brought up a mass of phlegm that cured all his ailments. Now, these last two illnesses reflect the complete dissolution of the family. Um, so it's all in progress, but now the family is well on its way to falling apart. And the final two that get mentioned are Jack's sudden death in 1705, followed by Dick taking advantage of a fit of sickness to have his sister Anne Phyllis committed as a madwoman. So it was clear by this point who Sir Richard's true enemy was, not both sons as he'd initially believed, but quite specifically Dick. Jack may have been wayward, but Dick was unstoppable in the persecution of his own father, as he put it. Now, each of these illness occurrences underscored important moments within the narrative. But Sir Richard also relied on ideas about the connectedness of body and soul, and he used particularly the language of pain to emphasize his emotional suffering. That the body could reveal the truth of the soul is an important motif in pre-modern literature and law. Newdigate's descriptions of his son's physical bodies revealed their true natures. Jack's remorse was plain to see. After the first confrontation, he of course took ill. Um, 
And after the second time that Jack took ill, he was extremely penitent, declaring with tears and great compunction his apologies to his father. And this is important because if you could cry, it meant that you were truly guilty or it could also prove your innocence. So it's proper reconciliation, unlike Dick, who simply mouthed the words, but continued to put all the slights and affronts that possibly he could onto his father. But Dick's true nature had been visible even earlier, as Sir Richard then goes on to tell, because he'd been seemingly grateful and friendly to his father when he moved back home. Dick, a lawyer, had advised his father to lease part of the land as a tax dodge, Sir Richard then offered a prime lease on part of the estate to Dick as a mark of favour. At that point, Dick blushed and then looked pale, which his father did not take much notice of then, but has since, since often thought thereof. Dick's body betrayed his ill intent and shady dealings in that moment where he flushed and went pale. Throughout the pamphlet, Newdigate also used a mode of language to play on readers' sympathy. These pain descriptions in the 18th century were evocative and intended to persuade readers of very real suffering. The words chosen by Sir Richard had dual physical and emotional meanings. Dick, for example, was described as a peccant son, referring both to his sinfulness and to causing disease. Like a bad humor, he was infecting the family. Newdigate described his reputation as lacerated, his dealings with his children as injurious. Now, at the start of the family, Newdigate also named himself as gentleman or father. But as the narrative continues, he upped the number of references to aging and illness. By the middle of the narrative, um, references to aging and illness, there were 15 references to aging and illness. Um, and these tended to occur most heavily in strategic spots. For example, aging and illness came up five times when he talked about his illness, and again in the pamphlet's appendix where he talked about it six times. So it's something that was reiterated. References to age during his illness added to the image of himself as a victim and a helpless old man. I think he was trying to eradicate from readers' minds the very lewd madman accused of incontinency with his own daughters that had been the bywords about London. The references in the final section reinforced, reinforced his agedness in the minds of his readers, emphasizing that he deserved respect for his service to the country and suggesting that he was a victim of his children's greed. The peak of his descriptions of himself as unwell or a victim occur in the section describing his illness. In the space of two pages alone, he described himself as sick twice, unhealthy once, persecuted twice, and afflicted once. The family troubles were as much physical as mental for Newdigate. An illness was important in this narrative, drawing attention to important moments in the breakdown. This use of language would have appealed to his audience's imagination and added sympathy for his suffering. Now, Newdigate's narrative, which referred to him as an old sick gentleman in the title, relied on these early modern anxieties about the vulnerability that came with aging and the possibility of being abandoned or abused. By focusing on illness and suffering, he kept this idea of himself as victim at the forefront of readers' minds. Sudden illness could shift green old age into decrepitude, but the problem was less about physical indignities than growing vulnerability. The sons launched their attack on their father's independence when he was most vulnerable, he was age 66, and he might have expected his family's support instead. To emphasize the full horror of the situation, Newdigate turned to a biblical story that in Genesis 9, verses 18 to 29, and this is a story his audience would have known well. After the ark landed, Noah left to plant a vineyard. He drank too much wine and lay naked in his tent, which Ham, his son, discovered and shared with his brothers. Shem and Japhet acted as the good sons by covering his nakedness and taking care not to look. Newdigate, though, complained that his children were even more terrible than Ham, pretending nakedness where there really was none. The son's treatment of their father, he seems to suggest, hastened his old age, as the use of the term old in the second half suggests. 
The children tarnished his reputation and social credit with rumors. Their attacks emphasized his physical vulnerability. Besides the attempted poisoning, the sons had even organized a, his seizure by a strong ruffian who took him in his arms. In other words, the ruffian picked him up like a child. And Sir Richard had to be rescued by a friend, leaving him totally humiliated. So it really was no great leap to think that maybe Dick might very well pose a threat to his life. And of course, worse yet, his children's actions had systematically removed his independence by breaking up the family and isolating him. When he was committed, he was penniless, servantless, and nearly friendless. Then, after the settlement of 1702, his daughters were sent to live with their maternal uncle. Newdigate may have retained control of his estates, but the children were estranged. And certainly Dick was worse than ever. So that ends the tale of the old sick gentleman, which I think is a very skillfully crafted narrative that really did play on the images of a suffering old man who wanted the best for his ungrateful family. So that's using largely his, his, his own account. Um, but there's a number of other family papers through which you can piece together another account. And reconstructing the children's story is much more problematic, particularly in terms of what sources are available. One account book was kept by Dick, and there's a few family letters or letters written to Sir Hans Sloan. But otherwise, it's necessary to read their father's published and manuscripts accounts against the grain. This account is a much darker one than the alleged neglect of an elderly parent. For example, was Sir Richard incontinent with his daughters? He himself referred to that. And why was there so much mental illness in the family? Was this a tool of power? Was it a cause of the disordered household? Or was it a symptom? At the very least, in the second version of the family story, Sir Richard was a bad patriarch who mismanaged the family estate and was mentally unstable. At the worst, a case could be made that Newdigate had begun sexually abusing his daughters after his wife's death. Just as Sir Richard constructed his narrative around points of illness, so too does illness emerge at crucial points for the rest of the family. Issues of gender, hierarchy, and agency also frame my analysis of how the children resisted their father's control and established their own family strategy. The children's story starts back in what both Sir Richard and his biographer Eileen Gooder suggest are the family's happier days. But even then, there's inklings that Sir Richard was a hard taskmaster who controlled his children through money. For example, he used a complicated system of rewards and penalties, which he kept in his account book when dealing with his children. This wasn't necessarily negative. For example, when Elizabeth was six years old, he paid her to find a missing document. He also paid three of his teenage daughters to come to family prayers. But he employed fines for misbehavior. For example, he fined Amphilus and Francis, then aged 25 and 17, one shilling each for their annuities when they fought over a card game. During a dispute with the teenage Elizabeth, he threatened to reduce her dowry by 1,000 pounds. Now, Eileen Gooder, who was Sir Richard's biographer, sees these as instances when he was always willing to forgive and forget, perhaps. But it also suggests an attempt to micromanage his children's behavior. Sir Richard also certainly admitted to having a bad temper. In 1683, for example, he noted in his diary, quote, I was violent angry today upon a small occasion. And he wrote in the margin beside it, violent anger. Was this introspective self-study or just the tip of the iceberg? The real problems, however, began with the death of Sir Richard's wife, Lady Mary, in December 1692. The following summer, Sir Richard took all seven daughters and his son Jack for an extended visit to London. And Phyllis, then aged 23, naturally took over her mother's place as mistress of the household. And from 1693, her signature appears on receipts for general household expenses. Her father noted in the account book, Mem, short for memorandum, I now order my daughter Phil to receive no money of the rents of any but myself, who will pay her duly quarterly. I likewise order her to pay duly for whatever she has without running into debt upon pain of my utmost displeasure. 
I likewise order her to pay all postage of letters that come to her and all carriage of goods as each of my children, except it be upon my own business. In other words, she pretty much was taking over the running of the household. As a mark of her status, Sir Richard gave her her mother's best recipe book, though with the intention that she would leave it behind when she married. But only a few, later, a few years later, the family, as we've seen, was falling apart. And the declining health of two of the daughters suggests that something wasn't quite right. Frances took ill in 1696, and the details of this aren't clear because there's no medical receipts in the book. She shortly eloped, and her new family covered them instead. In 1697, when Aunt Phyllis became ill, Dr. Hewitt suggested that it would be better if she went to stay with her aunt. The illness was unspecified, but this may have been the first of her many bouts with mental illness. She stayed with her aunt for several weeks, although her father continued to pay for her medical expenses. The real breaking point, though, came after the trip to France in the summer of 1699. Sir Richard, as I've mentioned before, took Dick and Elizabeth, who was then 17, or 18, on the trip to France. And this he did despite describing Elizabeth at another point as the crossest of any child that I have. When Dick, Elizabeth, and a servant became extremely sick in Paris, Sir Richard hastened to return them to England. Um, and then he resumed his own travels onward. So what happened there? The illnesses may very well have been a cover for a family dis dis dispute. There's certainly some suggestion in the family papers that it was Betty and Dick who really wanted to return home quickly. Um, and Sir Richard didn't want them to go back quite so soon. The family records don't refer to it, um, but Sir Richard hinted in his pamphlet at the unhappy differences between a father and a son and a daughter of his which he thought had been resolved by 1701-1702 through the mediation of friends. So in other words, it seems to be referring to whatever had happened on that trip. Now, in his account book, number or letter D, Sir Richard noted that the book begins at Lady Day 1701, which contains the most uncomfortable part of my life. Along with Dick, Elizabeth appears to have played a large role in going against her father. Age 22, she was still living at home in 1701-2, along with Jane, age 20, and Juliana, aged 18. Their sister, Lady Sedley, who was age 24, had been recently widowed. Two other sisters, Anne, age 21, had married in 1698, and Mary, age 27, in 1696. And Phyllis was also still at home, um, but aged 32, she was now incapacitated by illness. Now, Elizabeth and Juliana um, seem to be quite special cases here as well, because they received special dismissal in the family Bible. Although they were not the only children to have eloped, as we've seen Lady Sudley had herself eloped, they are the only two mentioned as having married herself rather than simply married which suggests a level of family bitterness about the elopement. Eileen Gooder argues that Dick, now in his 30s and a mere assistant to his still vigorous father, wanted to seize financial control of the estates. This is one interpretation, but perhaps the father had been behaving erratically. He did, after all, have a temper, as he admitted himself, and he was quite well known for publicly. And perhaps there were concerns about Sir Richard's management of the estate. He'd been increasingly indebted as he put more and money, uh, increasing amounts of money into inspecting and preparing his mighty coal work. Um, and this is just a page from his, his medical, from his receipt book. Um, by having their father declared a lunatic, Dick gained control of the Warwickshire estate and Leicestershire rents. Jack was given the Middlesex estate. Now, the legal decision was soon reversed, but there was another attack to come. Anyhow, right there, that bit of cramped handwriting is talking about the coal works and the reason why money hasn't been paid is because of the coal works. 
So in other words, there is some suggestion that he might have been um, putting money where his family didn't think he should be. By February 1701 too, the daughters had accused their father before the House of Lords of the cruel severities and unreasonable usage and practices. What does that mean? Sir Richard described the daughter's suit as abominable, malicious, false allegations. Now, abominable is a telling word choice because it was often used to refer to things against nature in this period. Did he mean that the rejection of his authority was abominable? That could be one argument. You don't go against the patriarch. Or had their allegations been about an abominable act? Whatever the case is, rumors abounded Sir Richard complained in his pamphlet that the generality did look upon him to be either a madman or, which was worse, a very lewd one. The settlement of 1702 is certainly very curious, as all of the children were given their share of the estate or dowries, but the daughters were sent to live with their uncle and had to go within 10 days. Whatever the rift, it was never mended. As Sir Richard indexed in his account book, um, put daughters, 1705-6, their unkindness to me. So even a few years later, the family rift was still there. Was there evidence to support the allegations of lunacy and lewdness? Something happened on 10th of April, 1701. And this seems to have been the point, the sufficient case for the sons to begin proceedings for a lunacy inquisition. Sir Richard already had tendencies towards sometimes violent outbursts, but whatever happened must have been particularly dreadful. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened. <clears throat> um, in late May, a jury at the Court of Orches, of course, declared um, him insane, but they referred specifically to him becoming deranged on the 10th of April, and because of this was now incapable of managing his affairs. But these financial problems that he'd been having didn't help. And reading through his account books, a man emerges who was overly obsessed with accounting for everything, including emotions, but always failing to keep really good accounts. The money concerns continued long after the settlements of 1702, and the estate at Sir Richard's death suggested that his sons may have been right to worry about mismanagement. He bequeathed to Dick 55,000 pounds in debt. That's a lot of money. <laughs> in several places in, a, in his account books, he indicated that he couldn't recall paying or being paid debts. And he constantly came up with bizarre schemes to get money. For example, in his 1705 accounts, he wrote out a list of where and how to get money as it occurs, including fattening up beasts. In 1706, he had another scheme, how to pay debts, anno 1706, and which respite. He further explained that he was short of money because of the treachery of the coal pit manager who had carelessly allowed the, the deepest and most productive mines to flood. So nothing to do with him, it's always somebody else. But Sir Richard also seemed to use money as a method of control. During the dispute of 1701-1702, Dick apparently made a claim against the estate upon pretense of a mass of his annuity. So Sir Richard didn't think it was valid, but Dick obviously did. 1703, Dick was still having trouble accessing what he thought was rightfully his. Sir Richard's management of the portion from Dick's first marriage was in question many years later, with Dick claiming that he should have received more money. The account book also has an emotional facet. For example, Sir Richard had an anti-why, as he called it, you can see that at the top of the page, in which he ranted that, since my death hath been so much desired, I will part with no reversions. If my son returns to his duty and filial affection, I design him 3,000 pounds per annum. Since I wrote this, my son RN has been so base to me that now I will have the portion. And his account book is filled with little details like that, where he talks about the wrongs done to him. Um, Sir Richard specified in his 1705 accounts exactly what he'd done with the 2,500 um, £2, pound portion from the first marriage and why Dick would not get any more from it. 
The account book shows that Sir Richard even accounted for a family scheme for the happiness of it. And he tried to you know, come up with schemes for making peace with Dick. Although he also repeatedly took note of Dick's and his daughter's unkindnesses, which he also accounted for, and the continuance of Dick's devilish humor. Sir Richard also insisted upon his continuing generosity to his daughters. He did pay most of Amphilis's medical bills, even though she lived with her sister, Lady Sudley. He noted, what their, what their grandfather intended for them, if I had no son, was much less generous than what he'd actually settled upon them. He was a more exacting keeper of emotional tallies than financial ones. Maybe he wasn't such a good estate manager, and he certainly was emotionally manipulative. But none of this equates to lunacy, and indeed, of course, he was released from that accusation in the end. Public opinion seemed to be that this was a stitch-up job because the sons wanted control. And certainly, you know, the gentry in this period were constantly indebted. This family was not atypical in that respect, but that didn't mean that the heads of family should be so undermined. So why try to have their father committed if the case really was that slight? If we consider this as a family strategy, I think it makes more sense. If the sons had been successful in their gambit, they would indeed protect the family assets. But more importantly, the four daughters, who at that time were unwed, Amphilis, Elizabeth, Juliana, and Jane, would have had their reputations protected while being separated from their father. The alternatives were that they did nothing or that the daughters brought an accusation against him which of course is what they did when Sir Richard was found sane. Historians of child sexual abuse, such as Sarah Tulalan, have found that as with rape, successful prosecutions were low, especially with older children. Children could also be re-victimized. For example, family members might punish them physically to name the abuser, and in the cases of older girls, a public court case could damage their reputation and marriageability. It's rare for historians to uncover cases of sexual abuse within the family, even though, as we know today, this is the primary locus of abuse. Accusing the patriarch in particular would have elicited a number of tensions. While an abuser was clearly not fit to be a household head, it was also problematic to go against the established order. Within the household, the father was the equivalent of the king, God's representative on earth, no less. Here, Sir Richard's parallel of the situation with the biblical story of Ham is curious. If you go back to medieval explanations for the story of Ham, um, they always tend to highlight the hints of sexual, impri impri um, sexual improperness. Had Ham castrated Noah or raped his own mother? Early modern readings of the story tended to see it as a tale undermining patriarchal authority, revealing the father's metaphorical nakedness and turning him into an object of ridicule, for which the sin of the son was forever written upon the, son, the skin of his descendants, turning them black and therefore inferior, according to the early modern social hierarchy. So really, it made more sense to attack Sir Richard for financial mismanagement and renowned bad temper. These could be more easily, proving, more easily proven rather than accusing him outright of unreasonable usage. And this would allow the family to conceal, potentially, an even deeper shame. But was there any other evidence of Sir Richard's lewdness? Individually, there's no real clincher, though collectively, there's, there's suggestions. Had the case been heard at the House of Lords, the three key witnesses who would have been called were people intimately entrenched within the household, Obadiah Key, steward and gentleman, James Nash, clerk and chaplain in the household, and Mary Eburn, widow and the family's nurse. The family had, moreover, an unusual number of elopements. The first, of course, was in 1695 with Frances Lady Sudley. Sir Richard had been so outraged at her elopement that Sir Charles Sudley's own father attempted to intervene on behalf of the newlyweds um, and tried to tamp that down. Um, Sir, Richard, sorry, Sir Charles Sedley Sr. had also expressed concern with his daughter-in-law's health and wondered if staying with the Sedleys rather than going back to her father would be more beneficial for her recovery. According, of course, to um, the family Bible, Elizabeth and Juliana had married themselves. So why this rash of elopements? For Francis, I can't help but wonder whether the elopement was an attempt to escape an untenable situation. 
And for Elizabeth and Juliana, who married right before and right after their father died, was this an attempt to exert some sort of control over their own lives? As with Francis's illness and elopement, the children's bouts of ill health offered an opportunity to obtain what they wanted and to resist authority. Um, Jack, of course, is taken ill right when his father's about to confront him. But then Amphilis's illness is especially intriguing. Was there a strain of mental illness in the family? This is something that keeps coming up, which her father and brother Frank also shared. Or had her illness been triggered by her father a few years after she'd assumed the role of mistress of the household? In any case, the need for constant care, either for, from her aunt or sister, allowed her escape from her father. The severity of Amphilis' illness emerges in the account book's frequent notations of her care. Um, it was in the thousands over the years. Um, in 1709, Lady Sudley alone paid Hans Sloan 25 guineas for his attendance on her over several months. So she, she does seem to have been really very quite ill. Elizabeth explicitly used her poor health to marry Abraham Muir, a Huguenot schoolmaster whom the family suspected might be a fortune hunter. In 1705-7, to seven, unmarried Elizabeth was being treated by Sloan for ambiguous symptoms that could relate to a venereal complaint. In particular, whites and weak, or the flow of the whites, um, from the, which is a vaginal discharge, and a weak back. Now, the significance of that isn't necessarily obvious. Again, it could be any number of things, but often in sexual assault cases of children, the presence of those sorts of issues was held up to be signs of sexual assault, which how else could they have contracted it? One letter to Sloan from 1706, of course, reads like a tale from a romance novel in which she detailed her unhappy family circumstances, penury and illness, um, and begged for, for Sloan to help her out um, in this. Anyhow, the family obviously doesn't seek out illness, but the stress points and interactions within their dysfunctional family, I think, become visible during moments of illness. And of course, arguably, Sir Richard's narrative becomes a language for the further family dysfunction. At some point, somebody in the family also went to lengths to conceal what had really happened. Um, the most revealing bits of the story have been excised from the record. The House of Lords hearing never ended up happening. The lunacy accusations don't detail what happened on the 10th of April. And then there's the missing family records, like this one, where you can see quite deliberately one word has been sliced out very, very neatly. Um, and this, this happens in several places. Um, Although much of the family correspondence was kept, a lot of the letters that Sir Richard refers to in his account books as referring to the actual disputes, because he'll say he received a letter talking about this, when you actually go to look at the family papers, they're not there anymore. Um, even more tantalizingly, where in the indices of the account books and diaries suggest that there should be some details on the dispute these sections have been sliced right out like this. What was the daughter's unkindness? Um, he's got daughters of mine and then something missing. Or on page 130, there's lunacy imputed discharge of, and it lists it as page 130. If you flip to page 130, all that remains of it are the usual accounts in a missing big chunk. Um, see, there's lunacy imputed discharge. There we go. That's where the lunacy imputed should have been. Who did it? Uh, biographer Eileen Gooder doesn't even mention these carefully obscured bits, although she suggests that Sir Richard was often cagey in general in order to prevent his accounts from being inspected too closely. But it doesn't make sense for him to cut out some of these sections when so many others like the anti-Y remain. Indeed, the reference to him being lewd comes from his very public pamphlet. If anything, his careful emotional accounting would have been a reproach to his heirs who would eventually see his papers. Dick the heir, I think, on the other hand, had much to gain from obscuring these things. The remaining sections on the dispute were primarily about him and the property. 
The missing bits were about the daughters and the actual accusation. It was in the family's best interest for the daughters and for posterity to cover up the nature of the family breakdown. So, with such fragmented stories, it's difficult for the historian to say definitively what happened. But one thing is clear, I think, which is that ill health provides a structure for the Newdigate family's story. It points to underlying tensions and emotions, and the moment of ill health can offer clues, if only very tantalizing ones, about what really happened. Mental illness, sexual abuse, ungrateful children, who knows. Family strategy, though, was important in both accounts. Sir Richard emphasized he was working for the good of his whole family. The children, however, if we take that version, wanted to cover up their shame, to control their own lives and to escape an untenable situation. The example of the Newdigates reveals the strengths and shortcomings of trying to reconstruct family case histories. The main problem, of course, is the potential lack of records, which required the historian to read against the grain, which, as you've seen, can be very tricky. But the strength, I think, is that we can see how illness shaped and reflected family relations, something all too often left out of medical and family histories. As for the Newdigates, this was a suffering family, whichever account you see as more convincing. Thank you. Thank you.